I love it. Well, it's right about noon. So I want to make sure we get you your full hour, Dr. Shea, but I uh, welcome everybody to our grand rounds on March 25th. Uh, I know our audience members will slowly trickle in as the hour goes on, but I want to get us started. So, um, Dr. Musselin, would you, I want to welcome you to introduce our speaker. And just as a reminder to everybody, um, you, oh, and I should introduce myself. My name is Tess King. I'm one of the inpatient chief residents. Um, I'll be moderating a Q&A at the end. And so for everyone joining us, please feel free to put questions in the chat as the talk goes on. And then at the end, uh, we'll go through the questions uh, with Dr. O'Shea. But Dr. Musselin, please take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Tess. Uh, so it is a great pleasure uh, today to uh, introduce uh, the speaker, uh, Dr. John O'Shea. And uh, today's uh, Grand Rounds also serves as the 2022 James Lane uh, Lecture. Um, so Dr. Uh, Lane uh, was the first fellow of the Rheumatology Fellowship Program, uh, graduated in, in 1959. We have a very long-standing fellowship program. And um, the idea with the Lane Lecture, the annual Lane Lecture is to invite somebody really eminent in the field of rheumatology uh, uh, writ large. And um, uh, I hope that uh, members of the Lane family have a chance to listen in to uh, this uh, talk as well. Uh, so today's uh, very eminent speaker is uh, Dr. John O'Shea, who uh, received his uh, MD degree from the University of Cincinnati in uh, 1978. Uh, and did a uh, residency after that at um, uh, upstate New York in, in Syracuse, uh, New York, and then uh, came to the NIH in 1981 as a medical staff fellow at the NIID. Um, he stayed at NIH and uh, went through a number of different uh, institutes. Uh, he was for a few years at the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development, and then from uh, 89 uh, forward at NCI, where uh, I actually didn't know this before, but he had a um, uh, uh, exquisite uh, military career as well uh, from that time serving in, in Fort Detrick, uh, where NCI has its uh, laboratories in Frederick, uh, northern end of Maryland. And he uh, is, is now a commander uh, inactive in the, in the reserve. Um, in 1994, um, he left NCI to join the National Institute for Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Disease, uh, NIAMS, as the chief for arthritis and rheuma rheumatism branch. Uh, a, a few years later, in 2002, he also became chief for the Molecular Immunology and Inflammation branch. And then in 2005, uh, until this day, he's the scientific director for NIAMS. And uh, also um, uh, a few years ago, he was the acting director for the NIH uh, Center for uh, Regenerative Medicine. Uh, Dr. O'Shea has um, a full page of uh, prizes and awards and uh, named lectures, single spaced. Um, uh, he has a honorary doctorate from St. Lawrence University. He has received a NIH director's award uh, four times uh, during his years at the NIH. Uh, 2014, he was uh, uh, quoted uh, in, as uh, one of the world's most influential scientific minds, which is uh, quite uh, an honor, I think, and certainly true. Um, he has been extremely active in uh, organizing meetings, uh, reviewing uh, grants and many, many other contexts, uh, serving as the editor for uh, journals and so forth. And he has, um, to his uh, name, uh, way over 300 uh, publications, many of them in uh, top journals. Um, I, I got to know uh, John about 30 years ago, when both of us uh, worked in the new field of trying to understand how the T-cell receptor works and its mechanisms of uh, signal transduction. We had many uh, meetings uh, in, in, in that uh, area and we discussed science and numerous uh, wonderful occasions. And I think um, uh, John's biggest discovery in that um, 
field came uh, in 1994, uh, a paper published in, in Nature, um, where he uh, reported that the newly uh, cloned kinase, uh, now called Jack 3 which he actually had uh, found a few years uh, earlier in that same year, that it plays an important role in signaling from the interleukin-2 receptor. And that gave rise to a um, explosion of activity in this field. It turned out that all of the Jack family kinases in a pairwise fashion uh, participate in the signaling from uh, many different uh, cytokine and, and other uh, receptors, uh, really a fundamental paradigm in how the immune system uh, works. And, and as you know, that resulted in uh, uh, drug development uh, and, and um, first uh, by Pfizer, followed by many other companies developing uh, JAK inhibitors. And I uh, think that that's what um, John will tell us in, uh, in great detail uh, and I'm going to add only uh, two important things. Uh, the first one is that uh, John is an active uh, musician, still plays in a rock band, uh, typically mandolin or guitar. And he tells me he'll play whatever instrument Francis Collins uh, tells him to uh, play when they get together. And so I'm just going to leave you with uh, my own little tagline uh, about John and his uh, accomplishments scientifically before I hand the microphone over to him, which is that you don't know Jack unless you know John. So John, please take it away. Thanks so much, Thomas. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen if uh, AB tells me it's okay. And let's see if I can do this right. They have a bet that I, I, I may not get it right. Um, let's see, and I'm halfway there, I think. Am I doing okay so far? Looks great. Perfect. Okay, and uh, my laser pointer. Okay, great. So um, audio's okay, video's okay. Um, so I, I want to talk about jack inhibitors, as you um, were was alluded to, and in, in, in Thomas's really very generous introduction. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, cytokine signaling and and uh, and how that um, with the discovery of the JAK-STAT pathway and how that led to. Um, the use of JAK inhibitors and talking about the, their um, mechanism of action um, and including um, approved inhibitors and uh, current ones being tested and more in development. And then maybe talk, uh, touch on some um, obvious uses and less obvious uses. And then maybe a little um, speculation um, as well. And you know, caveat, um, I hope um, I'm gonna to try to leave enough time for, for some discussion because I'm gonna be touching on a few areas that um, um, I'm gonna talk about a bunch of things that I think I am an expert on, but some areas that I'm definitely not an expert on. And I'd like to hear your input. That's always a fun part of going around and, and telling the story. And often when I come back, people send me pictures of their dogs who are on jack inhibitors, but um, um, you can still do that, although I won't, get to chat with you after my talk. Okay, so disclosures, um, um, uh, I have a patent, the NIH has a patent um, related to um, targeting JAK inhibitors and I have a, um, a longstanding agreement with Pfizer that just ended uh, last year. Um, but in case you're too worried, um, you know, this was the royalties that I got last year, uh, as you imagine, as a US uh, government employee. And I guess I have to show this slide as well. Um, and, and just to show that I actually did review this information um, for, um, um, for the purposes of this uh, talk. Okay, so I, I thought I should start with a, a clinical presentation. And so um, um, you'll see why I, I might be presenting this patient. So a 59-year-old woman with a long history of seropositive um, RA. Um, she was on methotrexate, prednisone, hydroxychloroquine, but failed to achieve remission um, or had adverse reactions to flunamide, adalimumab, infliximab, abatacept, rituximab. So all of, you know, all of those um, really remarkable molecules that um, we, um, I'll, I'll touch on this in a bit, um, in, the, in the latter part of the um, 20th century, uh, uh, sort of gold standards for treatment of this disease. On exam, she had synovitis, tenderness um, in, in multiple joints, 
Also had scalp lesions uh, diagnosed as alopecia areata, and I'll, I'll touch on that as well. Um, her lab showed um, um, you know, elevated um, um, SED rate and CRP and, and um, positive uh, rheumatoid factor CCP, ANA. Um, and so the question, you know, is what, what do you do with patients like this? And a bit of a spoiler alert, um, patient would start on tofacitinib, so, but um, I'll tell you, um, a bit about that and, um, and a bit why I, I chose this particular patient for, for um, this discussion. So I think um, all of you know, you've seen slides like this many times that are you know, sort of overwhelming and, and probably uh, not terribly informative um, unless you're a cytokine biologist. But, but the point in a way here is that um, there are probably 200 things that are, you know, you could call cytokines in the human genome. And many are critical for host defense and autoimmunity and the like, but they often have um, other critical functions, hematopoiesis, tissue repair, homeostasis, metabolism, et cetera, et cetera. And um, on one level, you may say, well, you know, it's not something that you desperately worry about understanding the different classes of receptors, what they do. Um, but in fact, it does have some very practical purposes that I'll get to. And certainly as people are thinking about you know, using biologics as one strategy to treat um, various diseases or using JAK inhibitors. So and this is sort of summarizes what I was saying before is that, you know, thanks to the molecular biology revolution, um, we ended up with the discovery of uh, many, many cytokine receptors um, and then and cytokines. And then that was capitalized upon by, by industry making uh, many, many monoclonal antibodies that targeted uh, a large variety of, um, of cytokines and cytokine receptors. And every time I, you know, um, I put up this slide, I try to update and, and it get, the list gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, um, but despite all of that, despite, as I was alluding to with this patient that I just um, uh, described, um, despite these amazing drugs that are very efficacious and, and, and remarkably safe, um, patients can have incomplete remissions um, or they have adverse events and that sort of thing. So what other options were there? Um, and so one option um, to sort of state the obvious is you can go from outside of the cell to inside the cell and try to target um, um, signal transduction pathways with small molecules. And so that turns out to be true, and I'll show you that in a moment, but let me just tell you how we came to this. Um, and I'm gonna focus on this class of receptors, the type one, type two receptors, and, and um, you'll see that this is the family that encompasses things like IL-2 and interferon gamma, IL-6, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. And, and these molecules here um, are the ones that use the jak stat pathway. TNF family members, IL-1, IL-17, some of the receptor tyrosine kinases um, generally do not engage, do not signal via JAKs and STATs, although um, receptor tyrosine kinases can certainly um, activate STATs, but the Janus kinases really are restricted to this, this class of, of cytokines. Okay, so this is where we were. Thomas and I were, you know, um, talking about this again in, in the days of the 1990s or so when, when you know, thanks to um, all of the work of people like Krebs and Fisher Lab and, and the work that was done um, at um, University of Washington and many other places trying to understand signal transduction in general, um, that we knew that um, we began to understand the structure of cytokine, cytokine receptors, but we, we didn't really know what happened once you... Um, um, treated cytokines with um, um, uh, treated cells with cytokines, but what we did know was that you saw a tyrosine phosphorylation of substrates, which you know in the early days, um, you know you had to do with you know loads and loads of millicuries of p32, but you know that was resolved by having monoclonal antibodies against uh, phosphotyrosine um, phosphorylated substrates. Um, so the race was on really um, um, by many many groups of trying to understand kinases and particularly tyrosine kinases that were involved in, you know, signal by T cell receptor and other receptors, but in particular cytokine receptors, that's what we were thinking about at the time. Um, 
and and the field was really blown apart um, by the discovery of the Jackson stats by um, by George Stark's group and uh, Jim Darnell's group. Um, but many of us, as illustrated here, um, were suspicious that um, tyrosine kinases would be proximal events in receptor mediated signaling, and so lots of groups, including my own. Um, screened libraries trying to um, identify new tyrosine kinases and trying to figure out how they might be involved in, in um, signal transduction uh, in, in immune cells um, and obviously other cells uh, as well. Um, but what um, George Stark and, and Sandra Pellegrini did, which was clever, is George made a series of um, mutagenized cells that were lacking interferon sensitivity. Um, and what Sandra Pellegrini realized is she, she reconstituted these cell lines um, with, with libraries and found that this uh, sort of um, not very descriptive tyrosine kinase called TYK2, TYK2 um, reconstituted um, signaling by interferons, and that was published in the paper shown here. Jim Darnell took a, a different approach, which was he was really looking at using the promoters of um, um, interferon inducible genes as bait to find to identify transcription factors. And this is how the, the, the pathway, um, uh, this really remarkably simple pathway of cytokines, cytokine receptors, JAKs binding to um, cytokine receptors being activated by cytokines, phosphorylating the receptor, and having stats bind to the receptor via SH2 domains and then dimerization also by the, di um, by the SH2 domains phosphotyrosine interaction and translocating to the nucleus. Um, but um, we now know that this, this pathway is used by the 57 cytokines uh, that, that employ the JAK-STAT pathway binding to this class of receptors. Um, but what we knew at the time was that um, thanks to George's uh, mutinized, uh, mutin mutagenized cell lines, um, how different jacks and different stats um, participated um, in signaling by a different cytokines. But what we didn't know at the time is we didn't know about the in vivo con consequence of um, jacks and stats. And as you might imagine, lot, lots of people did very quickly make knockout mice, but, um, but we came um, to the finding uh, that I'll tell you about in a moment, um, about what jacks do um, by actually um, looking at patients. So this is how the story unfolded. Um, um, when we cloned JAK3, we found it um, expressed in immune cells, and we were suspicious that um, it might be um, associating with receptors, of course, that would be pertinent to, um, to immune cells like IL-2, 4, 7, 9, 15, and 21, which Warren Leonard had shown that um, all of these cytokines use the common gamma chain shown here. And Warren showed that mutations of um, the common gamma chain underlie the disease X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency. And so once we found the interaction with um, uh, the common gamma chain, we made a prediction in, in this work and which was followed up by Gigi Notarangelo and his postdoc who actually was working in my lab at the time and Rebecca Buckley at Duke that um, you might have patients who had mutations of JAK3 that would um, phenocopy um, X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency. And so that turned out to be true in, in these patients, cohort of patients that Gigi was following in Brescia, Italy. Um, Gigi's now moved to the NIH and, and Rebecca Buckley uh, at Duke. Um, and so this really was the first knockout in the, in the JAK-STAT pathway that in this case really revealed the critical function, um, but also selective function of JAK3. So um, in that paper, um, we made this bold claim that um, this would be an opportunity to generate a new class of immunomodulatory molecules. Um, and, and as I get to, that turned out to be true, but like a lot of things in, in, um, in science, um, or like as you, when you're writing a grant, um, you make these predictions, um, which actually you have a good sense it's gonna turn out to be true. So we published that paper in 1995, but back in 1993, um, I was at this meeting in, 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 in Saxton River, Vermont, at Vermont Academy, um, with Thomas and I were, were um, you know, um, um, just recollecting uh, just what a great meeting this, these meetings used to be. They're pretty Spartan, but I do remember um, this was one of the meetings, um, not at this particular meeting, um, but this, this sort of same, the FAS meetings, or FASAD meetings, 
um, and where I saw Krebs and Fisher for the first time and saw actually many Nobel laureates trying to sort out how um, receptor mediated signaling occurred. But at this meeting where I was presenting the cloning of uh, Jack 3, I ran into this guy, Paul Chingalian, who I had interacted with previously. And, and Paul was told me he was at Pfizer and um, they were trying to make um, um, small molecule inhibitors. Um, and actually Paul is right here next to Art Weiss. And I think he was actually trying to develop at the time a, a ZAP70 inhibitor. But Paul and I, um, did this walk in the woods that was described here in this uh, in this Forbes magazine article um, said that you know really maybe targeting um, Janus kinases would be a good idea, and that turns out to be the case is that there are nine approved um, Jack inhibitors um, um, listed here for multiple indications shown here from uh, various forms of arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, juvenile arthritis um, for children over two years of age ankylosing spondyloarthritis, ulcerative colitis. And just this week, we had a, a new approval for uh, upadacitinib in uh, ulcerative colitis. Um, many um, dermatologic um, uh, indications, atopic dermatitis shown here, grass versus host disease, myeloproliferative neoplasms with ruxolitinib and, and other molecules. And then uh, unexpectedly um, for COVID-19, and uh, I'll come back to this in, in a bit. Many ongoing trials, I'm not gonna read through all of these, but everything from vasculitis, myositis, um, um, scleroderma, inherited interferonopathies, et cetera. And as I mentioned with this patient, uh, a lot of work in the area of alopecia areata. I wanna to return to, um, to lupus for a moment and talk about a, um, a small trial we did at the NIH, um, and which is particularly in interesting to us for, for a couple of reasons. So um, Dan Kastner and, and my boss, Lindsay Criswell, and uh, here at the NIH and, and Elaine Remmers um, with other colleagues showed uh, in the New England Journal paper that one of the risk factors of, of lupus beyond um, HLA alleles was, was STAT4. Um, and um, STAT4, the presence of the STAT4 risk alleles associated with more severe disease. And I'll show you in a moment, um, also um, biomarkers of, um, uh, of this disease as well. And that uh, a lupus um, is, uh, was recognized to be a, a, an interferonopathy around this time. And that was of interest to us because I had shown with a paper in collaboration with Chris Byron, um, that even though in the textbooks you'll, you'll see, you know, type one interferons um, activate STAT1, STAT2, but um, in, in this setting, in viral infections, um, turns out STAT4 is actually very important um, in responding to um, not just IL-12, but also type 1 interferons. And so um, um, the idea that STAT4 risk alleles participated in, in lupus um, severity and, and risk of lupus was uh, a particular interest to us. So um, we had uh, tried um, in preclinical models, um, JAK inhibitors, uh, <clears throat> and showed um, efficacy in, in this setting. Um, but one of the things that um, we did as well uh, was with, uh, by the suggestion of, of Betty Diamond, was that maybe we could stratify patients, whether they were STAT4 risk allele positive or, or negative. And I have to say at the time, uh, as you'll see in a moment, this is a very small study. Um, and I, I would have bet for anything that it wouldn't we wouldn't have the power to see um, the effect of the STAT4 risk allele. And like with many things in science, it turns out I was uh, completely wrong um, and I'm, I'm delighted that I was wrong. And I'll show you here what we found. So um, the study was done in collaboration with Mariana Kaplan's lab. And um, um, what you can see here um, is that um, uh, one of the features of lupus that Mariana has studied is uh, neutrophil netosis, and, and this is an image of that. And what you can see is that um, the um, response to, um, to uh, patients on tofacitinib during the trial, you can see reduction in, in, in um, netosis. And this was actually interesting uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, is that patients um, with the STAT4 risk allele actually have higher uh, degree of netosis and, and their responsiveness to the treatment was, was more significant if you had the step four risk allele. And you also see um, reduction in um, low density granulocytes, which again, 
Mariana Kaplan has, has argued that that um, is an aspect of the um, pathogens in, in lupus in, in this way that um, um, these subsets of, of neutrophils are, are associated with um, this increased propensity to, um, to generate neptosis. And this is um, one of the ways in which you can um, um, generate responses to interferon and, and contributes to the interferonopathy. Um, but we did not see global effect on neutrophils, which of course would be would be worrisome. Um, the, the work is published, was published last year in, in Nature Communications. Um, so I'm going to just um, go through this very quickly and summarize and, and get on to some other issues that um, will probably be of interest to you as well. So this is really just a, a small phase one, two trial with really on, only 30 subjects. Um, uh, staph 4 risk allele positive, staph 4 risk allele negative. Um, we saw no unexpected adverse events, and I'll, I'll return to that in a bit. Um, um, we saw um, inhibition of the interferon signature, which is sort of our positive control during the course of the study. And when we removed the drug, we saw that the interferon response um, returned. We saw um, decreased netosis. Um, and as I mentioned, the STAT4 risk allele is associated with greater netosis, but also a greater response to the JAK inhibitor. Now, um, JAK inhibitors, as I'll, I'll talk about in a bit, are associated with increased cholesterol. And um, we're particularly interested in this because, as, as you know, um, that um, now that we have better treatments for lupus, one of the big issues in terms of morbidity, mortality in lupus is cardiovascular events. Um, so we were very interested in how this turned out in our, in our small study. And what we saw was that there was increased cholesterol, but um, was increased HDL cholesterol and um, um, increased LCAT. And actually um, what Mariana Kaplan did was to look at non-invasive vascular function and actually saw improvement in, in, in this readout. Um, once again, there was an effect of the STAT4 risk allele. So in other words, patients with the STAT4 risk allele had a more a prominent response, positive response um, in terms of vascular function, et cetera. Now, again, I'll come back to this issue of um, um, uh, cardiovascular events associated with JAK inhibitors um, in, in, in the next couple of slides. Um, but we would make the case, even though in this you know, really small study, we actually saw a, a, a prominent effect of this STAT4 risk allele. And so you know, one of the issues, uh, Thomas and I were talking about this um, before, is that uh, a disease like lupus, so heterogeneous and often tough um, to, um, to identify drugs that are efficacious, um, in, in part because of the heterogeneity. So we would make the case that maybe thinking about um, STAT4 risk allele, and there's a, a TIC2 um, um, a variant um, that also um, um, actually is protective for um, autoimmune, uh, autoimmune diseases. And so um, stratifying patients for some of these um, um, risk alleles might be a reasonable thing to do in thinking about uh, trial design. We're doing a follow-up study uh, with a drug called gustacitinib. Uh, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, it's a JAK6 inhibitor. There are other going trials with other JAK inhibs, um, and ducravacitinib is one ducravacitinib, a particularly interesting molecule because it targets the, uh, the kinase light domain. And I'll, I'll show you that in just a moment. Okay, so, um, oops. And, um, um, uh, no, you know, like most drugs um, that are that are highly efficacious are often um, associated with a variety of uh, adverse events. Um, and as you might imagine, from the the, the um, I told you about the, our findings with um, Jack three mutations in a severe combined immunodeficiency. Not a surprise that Jack inhibitors are associated with serious and opportunistic infections. Um, but as I'll show you the data in a moment, um, the drugs are in this respect at the doses that are used um, are not that different from um, um, biologics, um, which in a way was, was definitely a surprise to me. I, I can tell you that in, in the early days um, when JAK inhibitors were first used for um, transplant trials, they were used at higher doses and used with a variety of other drugs, um, including Celsept and, and, and high, higher doses of steroids and the like. Um, and, and 
um, and in some um, dis disorders, um, especially interferon genetic interferonopathies in which high doses are used, you, you can have um, more infections, um, but at the doses that are currently used, as I'll show you, um, they're pretty equivalent to biologics with the exception of herpes zoster. Um, these drugs, um, um, current JAK inhibitors can be associated with anemia, leukopenia, and neutropenia. And presumably that's related to JAK2, and, and as I'll show you in a bit, JAK2 um, used by erythropoietin and, and other hematopoietic cytokines. Um, but um, I think we don't know that story in, entirely, whether all of it is related to um, um, solely to JAK2 inhibition or, or the participation of other JAKs. And again, uh, you know, um, what we need to do is, is study some of these um, events in, in um, um, molecules that are truly um, selective for different JAKs, and, and I'll touch on that. You see increased lipids, as I mentioned, including increased uh, cholesterol. Um, but as I alluded to in lupus, what we saw was that um, HDL is also increased. Um, exactly what this is to, due to, not entirely clear. You can see some of these changes in when you block um, um, IL-6 with monoclonal antibodies, um, but there are also other molecules that have um, important um, metabolic functions as well. So um, this is sort of an important area for, for, for research, for sure. JAK inhibitors are also associated with thromboembolic events and whether, again, whether that relates to JAK2 inhibition or not, um, not, not clear. And, and I got, again, I'll show you some of the details of that. Um, you might imagine that um, um, agents that block interferon signaling um, can be associated with increased cancers, um, and um, that, uh, that I'll, I'll refer to in, in the next trial in, in, in a moment. Um, but the diseases, a lot of the diseases we um, uh, um, treat, autoimmune diseases, and rheumatoid arthritis and like are also associated with cancer. So that is, is something that complicates the interpretation of the data. So I want to talk about something that I was not involved in, and, and as I was sort of alluding to before, something that um, uh, I certainly don't feel like I'm an expert. I'm not an ex trial design person. I'm not a, um, um, a statistician or outcomes person. So I'm very anxious to hear um, what others have to say about this. But uh, the oral surveillance, surveillance trial was in a trial that the FDA um, made um, the sponsors uh, perform. And it's, it was a four-year open-label, non-inferiority, safety endpoint trial with um, 4,000-some-odd 4, 4, patients with active RA, um, um, who despite um, methotrexate um, were still had active disease, 50 years and older. Um, let's see, I, I have a, a thing I got to move here, if I can move it. Uh, I can't, there we go, let me get this thing out of the way. I hope you're not seeing it, but I can see a, a notification. Uh, at least one cardiovascular risk factor. Um, patients were assigned one, assigned one to one to one with low dose TOFA um, BID, which is the approved dose for rheumatoid arthritis, 10 milligrams BID or a TNF inhibitor. Unfortunately, it was two different TNF inhibitors um, which were used in different parts of the world. And the short version of this is that um, uh, the collusions were that risk uh, of uh, major cardiovascular events and cancers were greater for TOFA than with um, TNF inhibitors. And um, so, but I'll, there's some nuances there that I, that I wanna just chat about. Let's see. Okay. Um, so here's, here are the data um, shown here. And, and this is, it was an, a non-inferiority trial. So the idea is that if you uh, crossed uh, 1.7, then non-inferiority was not shown. And, and those data are shown here. So, um, so this is all compared to a TNF inhibitor. And, and what you see here is that um, for the low dose, a high dose and combined doses, you exceeded um, the confidence interval of 1.7. Um, but, oops. Um, but what you also see is that um, the lower uh, boundary of the confidence interval crosses one. And, and what I'm, I'm depicting here um, are, are the data presented in a slightly different way um, with ad hoc um, T-value shown here. So the short, 
a version is this is that yes um the design was such that non-inferiority is not shown so jack inhibitors um, by this definition had increased cardiovascular events um but as you see that the um the incident the, the rates um really were were pretty similar for um jack inhibitors and and tnf inhibitors and as you can see with the ad hoc analysis um it was not um in this case, now I'm, I'm going into areas where I, I not uh, statisticians will tell me whether what I'm saying is, is correct or not. But by my interpretation and the data analyzed this way do not, does not look very significant, except that this is not how the study was designed. The study was designed as a non-inferiority uh, study. Okay, so these are the other uh, hazard ratios. Uh, 1.48 with cancers, higher 2.93 for pulmonary embolism. But this is what I was trying to point out before, was that for serious infections, which is what I would have predicted would be the most um, um, challenging part of these drugs, that turned out to be not, not different. So all, all of these data led to sort of the revised indications um, that for... Um, Patients with rheumatoid arthritis and an incomplete response to methotrexate, um, TNF inhibitors would be the preferred treatment, especially for uh, individuals who are 65 years older and, and certainly patients who had a uh, cardiovascular risk factor. Um, now, the problem, of, of course, with this trial is that there was no untreated control group. So we don't know whether TNF inhibitors were really good at, at, at limiting the number of cardiovascular events. And JAK inhibitors were pretty good, but not quite as good as TNF inhibitors. Or the alternative that, you know, um, you know the JAK inhibitors, these, these individuals, patients, older patients with cardiovascular events and with um, an inflammatory disease, whether TNF inhibitors were, were better. Um, I mean, we're, we're, you know, the JAK inhibitors made things worse or, or that, we, we just don't know because there's not um, the appropriate control group. The other part that, that's tricky is that we really don't understand um, the mechanism. So um, we know that JAK inhibitors can, in, by reducing inflammation, can reduce risks and, and exactly how that turns out and how that relates to TNF inhibitors, we really don't know from this study. And so in a way, we'll have to do prospective studies um, thinking about um, um, this, although, you know, obviously very much a challenge to do this in an ethical manner um, and have a control group. That's um, going to be something that's going to be hard, hard to discern. So um, rheumatoid arthritis, as I alluded to, is associated with cardiovascular events and lymphoma. And so um, it's going to be tough to sort of sort this out. And so I'm thinking about um, who is really at risk and um, 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 and how that relates to patients being in remission and what patients um, would be like most likely to be benefit and what patients should be avoided. That I think in a way that's still an open-ended question. And I just, this is uh, some data that was pub, um, presented at the AC, ACR. And again, what you see here is this is the group that um, was originally studied um, um, over 65 and, and including cardiovascular uh, risk factors and could, including smoking. But if you look at other groups, you see um, younger and not, had not smoked, then, then you actually see there's no added risk uh, of JAK inhibitors versus TNF inhibitors. So um, short way of saying, spending a lot of time with saying, I think there's, this is an important topic and it needs uh, further attention. Okay, so let me now... Um, turn um, to newer JAK inhibitors and, and um, what might be some of the opportunities. So just um, to remind you, there are four Janus kinases, JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and, and conveniently named TIC2, just to um, confuse everyone. Um, and they're, they're used in pairs that I'll show you in a moment and critical for 57 cytokines. Um, here's the kinase domain and the pseudokinase domain, and that's what gives the, the name of this family, the two-headed um, um, Roman god Janus. Um, and most, as 
of the inhibitors that um, I've been talking about thus far um, are targeting the kinase, uh, li the kinase domain. So they're, eight, they're competitive antagonists of ATP. Um, um, but as um, I'll show you in a moment, you can actually target the pseudokinase domain. This is a regulatory domain, so not, not a catalytic domain per se, but you can target this domain. So this is the pictures that you've probably seen many times, but um, um, reviewing what I told you before, that this is the gamma C um, cytokines, JAK3 binding to gamma C chain and um, JAK1 binding to the shared um, receptor subunit for these cytokines. And this sort of architecture um, is how it works with other cytokines that you have uh, one Janus kinase associated with one subunit and other Janus kinases associated with the, the other subunit, um, with the exception of um, the dimeric um, cytokine receptors like erythropoietin, prolactin, growth hormone, et cetera, in which case really you're only using JAK2. And the reason I show you this is, is thinking about, okay, so if you really do have a selective JAK inhibitor, um, what cytokines are you going to block and what cytokines are you going to avoid? And so back to maybe what we were thinking about in, in, in the 90s was that if you targeted JAK3 selectively, really you would only be um, targeting um, a, a small subset of cytokines, the gamma C cytokines. If you specifically target TIC2, then you in inhibit a, a, a relatively small number of cytokines, the interferons, um, uh, uh, GP130 using cytokines, although there's some ambiguity with that uh, Telden family, IL-12 uh, and related cytokines. Um, if you inhibit JAK1 and JAK2, you're inhibiting many more cytokines. Um, and JAK2, as I alluded to, uh, are, uh, the, is used by the cytokines um, like growth hormone, prolactin, erythropoietin. So very important for hematopoiesis and, and potentially for metabolic um, um, uh, 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 side effects as well. So again, you know, one of the things we didn't know, of course, is um, the good news in a way with the first generation JAK inhibitors is that you're inhibiting um, all these JAKs and then potentially um, 57 cytokines. Um, and what we didn't really know is that if you had increased selectivity, would, would you have in principle um, increased um, um, safety, um, but reduced efficacy? Um, so this is where we are now, um, is that we have first generation JAK inhibitors shown here. And I'm just illustrating um, that you really are blocking a large number of, of cytokines. And in some settings, that might be a good thing. Um, um, we're now in, in this era where we have some um, agents that are at least relatively um, selective for JAK1. Um, so eupatacitinib, I mentioned uh, in a few, few moments ago, um, relatively selective for JAK1, but at higher doses, you do see anemia in, in these patients who are on these drugs. Um, so it's, it's sort of a mix between this and this. Um, but there are other agents that are coming along and, and we need to know um, these, these drugs that in, in, um, in the assay show that they have selectivity for JAK1. Um, how does that actually work in, in people? And these trials are, are ongoing. Um, um, we have JAK1 TIC2 inhibitors, and, and I show you an example here, which again I show um, a more modest um, number of cytokines that are being inhibited. These are TIC2 inhibitors, um, um, both the Pfizer compound, and this is uh, Ducravacitinib, the BMS compound, and again, a relatively uh, fewer uh, sort of um, spectrum of cytokines that are blocked. And, and this um, uh, shows you JAK2 inhibitors, which for um, their oncologic settings in which you might want to selectively inhibit um, um, uh, cytokines that use JAK2 um, um, and then avoid some of these other cytokines. And as I just alluded to, JAK3 would give you the um, potentially uh, fewer cytokines um, that, are, uh, that are targeted. But um, there's another aspect of this um, drug that I'll point out in a moment. So again, um, just a picture form of, of how um, you have uh, the catalytic domain, the JH1 domain in JAX um, and, and the um, kinase-like domain. Um, and this is a picture of um, um, Janus kinases associated with the receptor. Fortunately, um, 
you know, we didn't really know the structure of, uh, um, of Janus kinase is the full, the full, full molecule until Chris Garcia's sort of amazing work that was just published in, in Science a few weeks ago. But, oops, didn't mean to move ahead. Um, but this is, would it give you an example of a drug that um, targets the, uh, the, the re regulatory subunit of uh, or domain of, um, of Janus kinases and Ducravacitinib would be an example of that. But I suspect we'll see many more uh, molecules like that going forward. Um, just reviewing uh, ritlacitinib, which has selectivity for JAK3, but uh, ritlacitinib also um, targets other uh, family members, uh, tech family kinases, including ITK, uh, tech, BTK, RLK, BMX. And you, you may recognize BTK, you know, Bruton, Bruton's tyrosine kinase, which is mut mutated in X-linked egg gamma globulinemia. And so this drug in principle, has the capacity to inhibit cytokine signaling, but also B cell receptor and T cell receptor signaling. So there's ongoing work with this drug and, and, and reported um, efficacy um, um, and, and actually no adverse events with ritlacitinib, but again, a very interesting molecule um, to, to follow going forward. Gusacitinib is the, is the drug that um, we plan to use at the NIH. Um, uh, um, the utility in a way is that um, SIC, as you may know, is important for B cell receptor signaling, FC receptor signaling, integrin signaling. And so in, in principle, this could be a, a useful drug um, in, in lupus in which um, these other receptors may be participating in pathogenesis. There's been a phase two clinical trial uh, that showed efficacy uh, um, with gustacitinib and again, uh, no unexpected uh, adverse events. There are combined inhibitors um, that actually uh, target JAKs and then um, other um, classes of, um, of kinases and, and uh, picritinib and omelotinib. Um, also uh, another uh, example of this and generally used in, in um, for on oncologic indications and less so in for autoimmunity and, and uh, other dermatologic allergic conditions. There are inhaled JAK inhibitors um, shown here, um, um, which in principle could be used for um, uh, asthma and, and other disorders. Um, but I must say at this point, uh, you know, there are still so many unanswered questions. Um, and, and in a way, I think there's probably more questions than answers at this point um, that we have more JAK inhibitors on the way that have better selectivity, including topical and inhaled um, agents. So um, um, we can certainly, I think, address some of the issues related to adverse events re regarding JAK inhibitors. Um, although, again, as I said, there's... Um, a very important study, um, but still some ambiguity um, surrounding that study. Um, but remarkably, despite you know um, the discovery of these molecules, it, it really took um, you know whatever uh, thirty years um, to get the full structure of, of Janus kinases. Um, again, Chris, Chris Garcia's work um, depicted here, and uh, one could imagine that um, we have many many opportunities. For, for targeting these molecules in a variety of ways um, um, at now that we have uh, the, the full structure. Um, the other part that I'd uh, you know, sort of like to um, 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 discuss just for a moment and, and hear your thoughts is that you know, when we made this first prediction in 1995 um, with these, this kid patients um, that, I, that I mentioned, um, we certainly, um, predicted that there would be efficacy uh, if you generated JAK inhibitors. Um, but what we really didn't know would be how safe these drugs would be. Um, and, you know, um, what we didn't know at the time is that these molecules uh, they really were, were um, ATP antagonists. So even the idea of generating a drug that um, selectively targeted um, ATP and to be honest, at the time seemed inconceivable. So that, that turned out um, that we can get a degree of selectivity. Um, um, but the other thing at the, at the time was that if you did not have selectivity, if you had a pan-JAK inhibitor, um, 
companies at that time really just gave up. If they had, um, a, they were trying to generate, for example, a JAK3 or a JAK1 selective inhibitor, and they had JAK2 inhibitor, they, they abandoned some of these projects. But as it turns out, these drugs in a way, um, surprisingly, are, are safer in terms of infections than I, I would have predicted anyway. Um, at the time, um, all we really thought about was T diseases really mediated by uh, T cells and B cells because the term innate immunity hadn't even um, been uh, coined at the time. Um, and certainly and, um, Dan Kastner and Rafaela Goback-Mansky have made a lot of efforts in this area and many others as well. Um, but JAK inhibitors turned out to be um, have efficacy in these settings, including innate, innate immunity, something we hadn't considered. Um, but the biggest shock in a way was the uh, a, a eff efficacy of um, uh, baricitinib, a JAK inhibitor um, in, in COVID, um, especially in patients who uh, require a supplemental oxygen. And that was published in the New England Journal. But uh, now there's um, a paper in there with, uh, with more patients in, in the recovery trial. And so um, um, we certainly had um, preclinical preclinical data that um, you could block, you could alter um, septic shock in our animal models with LPS. But um, when we sort of pose this to, you know, industry colleagues, um, you know, they were very skeptical that this would ever be a drug that would be used clinically. And so it is a way uh, that um, it really gave me pause thinking about um, lots of people use genetic models in thinking about how drugs can be used in different settings. But um, again, you know, it's it um, one needs to have a, a fair degree of, of humility in thinking about what you will predict or, or what you can predict with uh, with genetic model models. And and coming back to this. Um, 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 it really is interesting if these drugs have some efficacy in COVID, um, what other circumstances um, like COVID might these drugs be uh, useful? So um, I'm wrapping up um, uh, in, uh, in the next few slides um, and then a little bit of speculation. Um, um, in terms of the questions, when we think about what cytokines and what cells and what disease and what phase of the disease are these drugs working, I think we really have a, a still a relatively poor understanding. And, and what you would like to do would be to really understand in any given patient, what is the right dose and how you can determine that. And what are the optimal con uh, combinations of drugs? Um, we don't use these drugs with uh, biologics. Generally, that's often just gives you more. Um, if, you, if you combine biologics, you get more toxicity, um, 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 certainly with some, some drugs. Um, can we um, use these drugs um, in severe, uh, severely ill patients? And, and why don't we have any, any parenteral short-acting uh, JAK inhibitors. The half-lives are, are pretty short, so, but um, um, it was, as in discussions of um, patients um, in, in the ICU with COVID, um, it, in a way, it would have been nice if we had parenteral JAK inhibitors. Um, we use steroids for joint injections. I sort of, as always, I wonder, can we not use JAK inhibitors for joint injections? Would they have utility beyond stats, how do they work related to uh, steroids, et cetera. Um, one of the things that's interesting is JAK inhibitors actually give you quicker pain relief um, than biologics. And that certainly is an important area to pursue. Um, we know of course that um, nerves have, um, have cytokine receptors. And so there's this interplay between cytokines and nerves and, and equally um, uh, immune cells have neuropeptides, et cetera. Um, so this is really an interesting area in the, in the future. And so the question really is what can we measure to ensure optimization or predict efficacy? So this is my wild speculation. And it made me think going back to Jim Darnell's work, Jim focused on the um, promoters of all these interferon inducible genes um, um, but what we learned in the 20th century, thanks to my bandmate, uh, Francis Collins and, and all, all his colleagues, was that the human genome is only 2% genes and all the rest of this stuff, which at the beginning people didn't really have a clue as to what it was, but now thanks to um, technical advances, we know that there are many ways of looking at all the rest of this stuff. And what we know is that there's 
transcription um, that um, is regulated by um, uh, uh, parts of the genome way beyond promoters. Uh, a lot of the genome itself is transcribed. Um, much of the genome is active in, in cell-specific manners with uh, active enhancers that can be measured in, in a lot of ways that are shown here. And so you have um, thousands of cell-specific enhancers. I'll, I'll give you an example in a moment. Um, and the genetic links with human disease really um, reside within in the regulome here and not so much in, in, in the genes itself. So here's one of my favorite examples is the interferon gamma gene where this is P300 binding that we did in Th1 and Th2 cells. And you see P300 deposition through this long area of real estate. Um, here's the gene right here, but you have this enormous area of the genome that um, um, has um, all these active enhancers. Um, and that's different, right? That's, this is the example we're saying in Th1 versus Th2 cells. Loads of active enhancers here. Um, um, much less so in TH in TH2 cells. Um, and this um, very asymmetric distribution of enhancers in the genome has been referred to as super enhancers as opposed to typical enhancers. And um, the argument has been made that this um, super enhancer architecture is sort of a clue to uh, a loci like the interferon gamma gene that are, that are highly regulated in a very um, um, selective and, and specific manner. Um, and so that these genes uh, you know, really are critical re regulatory hubs. These are regions in the genome that are um, associated with GWAS hits. Um, and these regions of the genome are also are enriched for a long non-coding RNA. And, and this is an example here of the interferon gamma AS1 antisense long non-coding RNA. And, um, and it appears that uh, these long non-coding RNAs really may exceed uh, conventional genes. And um, I'm just gonna go through this quickly just to hit the high points. We made a couple of mice in which we knocked out the interferon uh, gamma AS1 gene in a conventional manner. And then we made a knock-in in which we blocked the, the RNA um, at we put a termination sequence. Um, this was done by uh, Katrina and, and Francesca Peterman in my lab um, and just um, to show you that actually the knockout really dramatically disrupted interferon gamma production. But even with the knock in, where you're just blocking the production of that RNA, you had um, um, interference with the um, generation of, of interferon gamma. And I'm going to go quickly and just show you a really interesting experiment that we did with Rafi Ahmed. So Rafi um, um, had patients uh, vaccinated with yellow fever vaccine, um, studied the primary response two to three weeks, and then heroically followed these patients for 10 to 14 years and looked at the antigen-specific T cells and found that 10 years later, um, you saw elevated um, um, levels of the long non-coding RNA, actually, even though you did not have um, uh, elevated levels of interferon gamma. I'm running out of time here. I'm gonna skip this next slide and just get to the, the end. And so biologics were, were an amazing uh, advance and it really revolutionized so much of what we do in medicine, particularly in, in, in for rheumatology. Um, and JAK inhibitors um, can be likened in a way to, to rheostats that um, you have more opportunity rather than just turning on and off the cytokine that we can titrate um, the, uh, um, the interference with the cytokine signaling. But in thinking about both our band, um, and I, I've you know, spent a fair amount of time mucking around with all these, um, you know, um, trying to optimize the sound uh, of our band, um, um, that really in, in the genome, there are, you know, thousands and thousands of these switches. And the question is, do, do we take advantage of that? And the answer is really not so much. We don't even really take advantage of how we can titer um, JAK inhibitors in any given patient. Uh, you know, the, the clinical trials uh, define safety and efficacy, but we don't really follow, uh, you know, how we're interfering with um, cytokine signaling in uh, patients, um, only to realize in a way that um, this is how it really works, that there's an enormous number of regulatory, um, you know, switches in the genome. And it would really be nice um, if we had, you know, a sound engineer, um, you know, next to the rheumatology clinic or even better in the ICU when we were giving a patient a JAK inhibitor, a patient on COVID.
So uh, I'm going to stop right there. Um, and these are some of the review articles. And um, probably some of you probably have to give this talk. So um, at some point, um, this is my uh, email address. And I'm going to stop right there and take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Shea. Uh, we do have a question in our chat, which um, I know we're right at one, but I want to get through at least one or two. So uh, we have a question that says, Clinically, some patients have a profound early improvement in their symptoms with jackanibs, but then resistance develops. Do we understand the mechanisms that lead to this resistance and would a combination of medications delay or prevent this medication resistance? Yeah, I mean, that's a, something which we could talk a, a lot about, but again, that sort of gets to the point of my frustration and that as much as, as all the things we could possibly measure, we, we mostly don't, and, and we don't have good, uh, you know, biomarkers of those things. So no, I, I don't have an answer for that, but I really wish we did. Great. Well, I don't see another question just yet. And since we're right over one, oh yeah, Dr. Masson. Yeah, test if there still is a, a second. I'd ask John. Please. Um, uh, I'm fascinated by the pseudokinase uh, inhibitors that have just as much efficacy uh, in blocking pathways as the uh, inhibitors for the active kinase domain. Do we understand how that works? Well, you know, we, we now just have the structure of the jacks, uh, you know. Um, so no, I don't think we have really a very sophisticated understanding of how it, uh, 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 works. I mean, uh, Oli Silvanoinen um, did really mm -hmm. lovely work a long time ago in this in this area, but again, didn't have the you know. I really am looking forward to the time when we can um, you know understand in real time how cytokine signaling is, is activating jacks and and you know sort of what you were saying, Thomas, earlier was mm -hmm. you know we really have a very limited understanding of how all of this works. But I think, you know, the technology is coming, right, for imaging um, all of this. If I could ask, uh, you know, I really would be curious, anybody in the audience who's read this, um, you know, the, the Opal Surveillance paper, and I really, you know, how do others see this, um, this um, you know, uh, trial design and what that really means for the risk. I'm not a um, statistician, so any statistician, is there a statistician on the airplane? Um, for <laughs> no. <laughs> and I, there may be, and they may not be able to- They're shy, to, they may be shy. Say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the I, not I say that you added your contact info in case there is, they can find you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know, again, the non, it, would a non-inferiority trial be the ideal way of sorting this out? I guess that's really my question. And I, I, don't, I don't have an answer. It's not my expertise at all. Well, I think it's great to pose some questions at the end. And I, I hope that people <laughs> do reach out to you. Um, from our group, I, I, if you maybe are able to flip back to your slide where you had your contact um, so people could see that. Beautiful. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. O'Shea. I, I want to, um, I'm really grateful to have you come and, and give this great talk. And um, thank you for everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your Friday and weekend to all. And we will see you back here next week. Thanks, John. Good to see you, Thomas. Take care.